uh, the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. Without objection, members of the full committee, not on this subcommittee, are authorized to participate in today's hearing. As a reminder, I ask all members to keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized to minimize disturbances while members are asking questions of our witnesses. The staff have been instructed not to mute members except when a member is not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members are reminded that all house rules relating to order and decorum apply to this remote hearing. Members are also reminded that they are or may participate in only one remote proceeding at a time. If you are participating today, please keep your camera on. And if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. If members wish to be recognized during the hearing, please identify yourself by name to facilitate recognition. The title of today's hearing is How Invidious Discrimination Works and Hurts, an examination of lending discrimination and its long-term economic impacts on borrowers of color. We will now move to opening statements, and in so doing, I will uh, recognize myself for four minutes for an opening statement with the understanding that the chair of the full committee will be present at some point and receive uh, one minute of the additional time that we have for opening statements. Friends, lie on a mortgage application to secure a loan and you are likely to get caught and criminally prosecuted for mortgage fraud with jail time as a consequence. Lie as a loan originator to deny a loan to a person of color and you are not likely to get caught. And if you do get caught, a civil monetary fine is likely the consequence as little more than the cost of doing business. HR 166, the Fair Lending for All Act, provides the best tool available, that is testing, to catch, prosecute, and deter these predatory criminal lenders. First, HR 166 will provide critical tools for detecting, ending, and sanctioning discrimination that would otherwise go undetected. It would deter the predatory lending that perpetuates race-based differences in wealth, asset accumulation, income, and financial security. There is no enforcement tool. Some things bear repeating. There is no enforcement tool with the utility of matched pair testing. This is why HR 166 creates a dedicated federal office within the CFPB charged with conducting such testing. Second, HR 166 would expand ECOA's terms to expressly prohibit lending discrimination against LGBTQ plus persons. Finally, HR 166 would establish criminal penalties for lenders and lending officials who engage in knowing and willful discrimination in violation of ECOA. Now, this concludes my opening statement. At this time, without objection, I'd like to place in the record the following documents. A GAO report dated February 24th, 2021, Federal Reserve Bank Materials, one, a document styled Financial Resilience Challenges, Challenges During the Pandemic, an article from the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank examining the history of discriminatory policies that leaves many Black and Hispanic households less resilient in the face of economic shock caused by the pandemic. Two, a document style mortgage repayment, race and monetary policy. Working paper from the Boston Federal Reserve Bank finding that Black and Hispanic borrowers pay more than 50 basis points higher interest rates than white borrowers in a large representative sample of loans insured by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Having made my opening statement, it's now my honor to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Barr, five minutes for his opening statement. Mr. Barr, I yield to you. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate I appreciate you yielding. I appreciate you holding uh, today's hearing. Thank you also to our witnesses for appearing today. Discrimination in lending and other financial services is wrong. It's illegal and it should not be tolerated. There is no room for compromise on that point. While discrimination is illegal, that does not mean that there are not large pockets of the population who continue to be left behind by our banking system. It is important that we review and address those problems holistically. Our discussion on the economic impacts of inequities in the financial system should extend to all un- and underbanked groups. Economic recovery is well underway in the wake of the COVID pandemic. Unfortunately, many Americans continue to struggle financially. The pandemic has exposed and exacerbated certain weaknesses in our financial system, highlighting how large portions of the population still have trouble accessing credit. Every American should have equal access to our financial system, regardless of their race or gender, whether they live in urban or in rural America or any other factor. One area of particular concern to me is the access to capital and other financial services in rural areas. According to a recent FDIC study, people in rural areas are more likely than their urban and suburban counterparts to visit a bank branch in person to do their banking. Unfortunately, the number of bank branches across the country continues to decrease and the pace of de novo bank formation has slowed significantly compared to pre-financial crisis levels. As there's been a movement towards online banking, we know the challenges that rural Americans face with respect to rural broadband, and that's another impediment. There were 181 de novo charters granted in 2007, but between 2010 and 2019, an average of fewer than 10 new, bank, new banks opened per year. A recent Federal Reserve study shows that 51% of the 3,114 counties in the United States saw net declines in the number of bank branches between 2012 and 2017. These declines in bank branches disproportionately hit rural communities. A total of 794 rural counties lost a combined 1,553 bank branches over the five-year period, a 14% decline. The negative financial impacts on rural counties of branch closures are perpetuated by the continuing difficulties due to burdensome regulations and other roadblocks of de novo community bank formation. The Federal Reserve Report identified 44 counties considered deeply affected by trends in bank closures and consolidation, which it defines as counties that had 10 or fewer branches in 2012 and lost at least 50% of those branches by 2017. 89% of the deeply affected counties are rural counties, including Nicholas County in my district and counties in the districts of several of my colleagues. The current framework of federal, state, and local laws prohibits discrimination of any kind in lending. Financial regulators have developed robust tools to ensure regulated firms play by those rules. To the extent that firms are failing to comply with those rules or additional statutory authority is needed to combat discrimination, we must act. However, we must also be cautious about imposing additional restrictions and regulations on lenders that do not accomplish a specific goal and monitor potential impacts of our actions on the widespread availability of financing to creditworthy borrowers. Emerging technology has allowed people to previously outside the banking system to access financial services and enhance lenders' ability to tailor their products to the specific characteristics of the borrower based on race-blind metrics. Meaningful restrictions on risk-based pricing will do more harm than good as creditworthy borrowers pay more for the capital they need. Promoting across-the-board financial inclusion should be a top bipartisan priority for this committee. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss ways to ensure more people, including those currently underserved in the market, have easy, fair, and safe access to financial services. I look forward to working with Chairman Green to ensure that discrimination does not occur in lending and to promote policies that expand access to credit and lead to long-term economic growth. And again, the warning is to not do away with risk-based pricing, which I think would curtail and restrict access 
uh, to uh, uh, credit for creditworthy borrowers. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, and I appreciate your commentary and look forward to working with you. Currently, we uh, have the chairwoman who has arrived, I'm told, and we will yield to the chairwoman of the full committee, the Honorable Maxine Waters, uh, one minute. Madam Chair, I yield to you. Thank you so very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Green. The discriminatory lending practices of the 20th century continue to affect minority communities long after their repeal. The effects of decades of government sanction of discrimination continue to plague our housing and lending markets today, ultimately hindering the ability of households of color to build equity and accumulate wealth through home ownership relative to white households. Since home equity is the primary source of wealth for most families, disparities in home ownership and home equity are key drivers of the racial wealth gap. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about what we can do to remedy the continuing economic effects of discrimination. I thank you and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me make an announcement if I may. We will have additional votes and uh, the staff has indicated that we will make a great attempt to wait until the first vote has expired or nearly expired the time. This way we'll be able to cast two votes and then come back to the hearing. Uh, my hope is that we will get this done as expeditiously as possible. Uh, today, I'd like to welcome each of our witnesses and I'm, I'm pleased to introduce this panel. Uh, William Darity Jr. is Professor of Public Policy at the African and African American Studies and Economics at Duke University. He is also the director of the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity. Lisa Rice, who is president and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance, is with us as well. Andre Perry, who is senior fellow at the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institute. And we have uh, Francis Espinosa, who is executive director of the North Texas Fair Housing Center and finally, we have, of course, Ms. Cheryl Cooper, who is an analyst for the Financial Economics Division at the Congressional Research Service. Witnesses are reminded that your oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer, and this timer should be on your screen, screen that will indicate how much time you have left and a chime will go off at the end of your time. I would ask that you be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony if you hear the chime so we can be respectful of both witnesses and the committee members' time. Without objection, your written statements will be made a part of the record. Once the witnesses finish their testimony, each member will have five minutes to ask questions. And may I remind members to please uh, get your questions and answers in within that five minute time period. Um, let me restate this differently. Uh, you would not at the end of your five minutes have multiple questions to be answered. Uh, please uh, be mindful of the time of other members in trying to get your time in within the five minutes. Uh, Professor Darity, uh, you are recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. I now yield to you. Barrier to of this barrier, albeit fully desirable, will not eliminate the gaping chasm in wealth between Black and White Americans. The fundamental reason for Black White differences in wealth is not high Black indebtedness. The fundamental reason is low Black asset holdings. A Prosperity Now study in 2019 reported that median black household liabilities were $30,800, while the median white household liabilities were more than twice as large at $73,800. However, white households had a median level of assets valued in excess of $260,000 
in contrast with the median black households assets valued at $55,900. The median black household had 40% of the debt of the median white household, but only 20% of the assets. Correspondingly, the ratio of assets to debts for black households was 1.6, versus 2.8 for white households, both measured at the median. Um, the magnitude of the racial wealth gap, driven predominantly by a racial difference in asset ownership is staggering. The 2019 survey of consumer finances indicates that the black-white wealth gap at the median was $164,000, and at the mean, it was substantially larger, $840,900. Assuming an average household size of three persons, the median gap per person was $52,500 and the mean gap was $280,000. These are conservative estimates of per capita differentials because the average white household size is actually less than three people. Many observers treat the median gap as the target for closing the racial wealth gap in the United States. In this context, it may be more appropriate to set the more demanding target at the mean. Wealth is so densely concentrated in the United States that 90% of the wealth held by white Americans is in the possession of white households with a net worth above the white median. Close to 99% of white health household wealth is held by those with a net worth above the national median, approximately $100,000. 25% of white households have a net worth in excess of $1 million, in contrast with only 4% of black households. The limitations of an exclusive focus on debt reduction rather than asset building comes into stark relief when considering a policy of student loan relief. Whether one eliminates student debt by trying to erase the difference at the median or the mean, there will be at best an incremental effect on the racial wealth differential. The net reduction in the gap will be $1,856 after we adjust for the enrollment rates that are different between the two communities. And therefore, the reduction amounts to only 3% of the total median gap of $52,500. It amounts to less than 1% at the mean gap of $280,000. Indeed, the key to understanding the sources of the racial wealth gap is government policy that supported the underdevelopment of asset accumulation in the black community. In January, 1865, General William T. Sherman, after Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, and he held a consultation with a group of black leaders in Savannah, Georgia, issued Special Orders Number 15. His directive assigned 5.3 million acres of land stretching from the Sea Islands of South Carolina to the portion of Northern Florida bordered by the St. Johns River as a site for settlement and property for the newly emancipated. Here was an intended preliminary phase of a substantial land reform on behalf of the formerly enslaved that would have amounted to at least 40 million acres of land for the 4 million persons released from bondage. Ultimately, only 40,000 persons settled on 400,000 acres, but even that small allotment was lost by the end of the year. Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor, ended the land allocation program and restored the properties to the former slaveholders. The promise of 40 acre land grants remained unfulfilled. Simultaneously, the federal government, under the auspices of the Homestead Act of 1862, was distributing 160 acre tracts of lands to upwards of 1.5 million white families in the Western territories. This huge asset building policy resulted in benefits carrying over to a conservative estimate of 45 million white living descendants of Homestead Act patents. The racial wealth gap in the United States originates with the failure to give the formerly enslaved 40 acres, while white Americans, including new immigrants, were given 160 acres of land. 
Conditions worsened with wave upon wave of white massacres that took place between the end of the Civil War and World War II. In the red summer of 1919, upwards of 35 white terrorist actions took place across the country in locations ranging from Chicago, Illinois, to Omaha, Nebraska, to Washington, D.C., to Elaine, Arkansas. The most famous of these Professor, white I'm uprisings- Professor, I'm going to have to ask that you summarize quickly, please. Uh, okay took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. I would add that the destruction of black property and the appropriation of black property that was lost in that period of time was compounded by the policies in the 20th century that discriminatorily provide support for asset building in the form of home ownership. Indeed, the effects of these disparities transmitted across generations result in the contemporary black-white wealth gap and the disproportionate growth in black debt matters in explaining America's racial wealth gap, but the disproportionate deprivation of black assets matters far more. By all means, we should take steps to make the credit market more racially equitable, but if our goal is to eliminate the black-white difference in wealth, the focus must be placed on building black assets to a level consistent with white asset ownership. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, Ms. Rice, you are now recognized for five minutes to give your oral presentation. Chairwoman uh, Waters and subcommittee chair, co-chairs, uh, Congressman Green and Congressman Barr and other members of the subcommittee, I want to first thank you for inviting me to talk about this really important issue. Housing and lending discrimination have been a part of the United States since its inception. And have helped create the racial wealth and homeownership gaps that Professor Darity has just spoken about. Due to government sanctioned discriminatory policies, as well as private market practices, uh, underserved groups have been systemically excluded from wealth building opportunities such as homeownership. These groups still experience high levels of discrimination. There are over 4 million instances of housing discrimination each year. Redlining, uh, which persists in various forms today, real estate sales discrimination, appraisal bias, lending discrimination, and tech bias are significant barriers that keep the dream of home ownership from becoming a reality for many people and contribute to the racial wealth gap. Moreover, structural barriers such as the dual credit market, uh, segregation and restrictive zoning ordinances create systemic impediments which significantly prohibit the ability of people of color to access fair housing and fair lending opportunities and perpetuates the racial wealth and home ownership gaps. The segregation of people based on race coupled with the segregation of resources drives many of the disparities in health, education, wealth, and many other areas. These structural barriers, these structural inequities are a reason Blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans are contracting and dying from the COVID virus at disproportionately higher rates than their white counterparts. So segregation is also a driver of the racial homeownership gaps. The homeownership rate for Black Americans, for example, is where it is when the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968. And the homeownership gap between Blacks and whites is as wide today as it was in 1890. There are many ways that invidious discrimination harms communities. For example, many of the technologies used in the housing and financial services space are biased and discriminate against con consumers of color. So tenant screening selection tools, automated underwriting systems, credit scoring models, risk-based pricing systems, digital marketing platforms, they all have discriminatory outcomes and lock people out of housing opportunities. Too many people experience discrimination when they seek to access uh, housing and housing related opportunities. Newsday recently completed an in-depth testing project on Long Island, New York, in which they found that 49% of African-Americans, 39% of Hispanics, and 19% of Asian-Americans experience discrimination, including racial steering. 
Real estate uh, discrimination can take on myriad forms, and our recent lawsuit against Redfin illustrates that. NAFA and nine of our member organizations conducted a comprehensive investigation of Redfin, one of the nation's largest real estate companies. The investigation uncovered disturbing practices that suggested really wide-scale discrimination and modern-day technology-based real estate redlining. The groups found that Redfin offered its best available service at significantly higher rates in extremely white communities and offered no service for homes in communities of color at much greater rates than in predominantly white areas. Appraisal bias and lending discrimination are also still too common. Analysis of Humda data uh, reveal that communities of color are still being redlined by mainstream uh, financial institutions. One way to overcome discrimination is to increase funds for testing programs. And the Supreme Court has stated that testing is one of the best mechanisms for ferreting out discrimination. And this is why the, Fair House, the National Fair Housing Alliance supports the Fair Lending for All Act, which would help address longstanding barriers to fair and equal credit by adding sexual orientation and gender identity protections to the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, but also make it illegal to discriminate against people based on geographical location uh, and also re-empower the CFPB to um, address uh, fair lending issues and to test for fair lending violations. And I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Rice, for your uh, testimony. Uh, Mr. Perry, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Chairman Green, Ranking Member Barr, Vice Ranking Member Timmons, thank you for inviting me to testify today on this extremely important issue that affects millions of people across the country. We are here today because we are tired. We are tired of paying more for less. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said those words in 1966 to 35,000 people in Chicago Soldier Field as part of the Chicago Freedom Movement, also known as the Chicago Open Housing Movement. Dr. King went on to relay housing price differences that resulted in Black people paying higher rents in Black majority communities for worse housing than their white counterparts. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy, King declared. Now is the time to open the doors of opportunity to all of God's children, end quote. More than a half a century later, now is still the time. According to the most recent census figures, the Black home ownership rate in America is 46%, almost the exact same level that it was when King spoke in 1966. This is compared to the white home ownership rate, which is roughly 74%. Even as overall U.S. home ownership has grown over the last two decades, there has been a catastrophic loss of home ownership in key cities that have large shares of Black residents. When, black, when people in Black neighborhoods do own homes, we accrue less wealth. Homeowners in disproportionately Black and Latino neighborhoods are gaining wealth at about half the speed at homeowners in predominantly white neighborhoods. One of the reasons is that these homes are devalued. In the 2018 Brookings Report, The Devaluation of Assets in Black Neighborhoods, Jonathan Rothwell, David Harshbarger, and I found that even after accounting for structural characteristics such as square footage, age, and number of bedrooms, as well as neighborhood characteristics such as crime and school quality, Homes in black neighborhoods were valued on average $48,000 less than they would have been if the residents of the neighborhood were mostly white. That's a cumulative loss of 156 billion nationwide. And we've witnessed viral news stories revealing how appraisers value black and white homeowners differently. In Jacksonville, Florida, a mixed race family looking to sell their home in a predominantly white neighborhood received an original appraisal of $330,000. After presenting a white owner, the, a second appraisal came in $135,000 higher. A similar incident occurred in Denver, again, after the family removed indicators of blackness the home increased in value by $145,000. In San Francisco, a second appraisal increased its value by $500,000.
We are here today because we are tired. We are tired of paying more for less. These seemingly individual acts of racism are part and parcel a structural problem. The housing market is structured to disproportionately exclude black and brown households. For instance, our zoning codes and building practices are streamlined to deliver large single family homes. My colleague Tracy Lowe and I showed in a recent study that for decades, the very largest houses, four or more bedrooms, have grown as a share of all housing inventory, while smaller homes, which are more affordable for low wealth families, have stagnated or declined. Over 6 million black and brown millennials would be considered mortgage ready if there were any attainable homes for sale in prime locations. Black buyers are subjected to racist steering practices when looking for a home. When applying for a loan, black uh, buyers are perceived as higher risk, leading to more denials and higher interest rates. Devaluation limits the amount of gain from refinancing. As, as we've heard, bad appraisals also rob families of wealth. And all of these housing industry actors blame each other for the problem. We are here today because we are tired. We are tired of paying more for less. We made individual racism in the housing market illegal. And when it finds its way back in, we make a headline. But structural racism rigs the game from the start. The root cause for these negative trends is structural racism, which is systemic. To unlock the potential of Black neighborhoods and their residents, Systemic racism must be pulled at its roots rather than trimmed neatly only to grow again. Thank you for my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Perry. Uh, Ms. Espinoza, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. You may. Yeah provides fair housing services to residents of North Texas. Our services consist of fair housing counseling, intake and investigation of housing discrimination complaints, and fair housing education. It's been 50 years since the Federal Fair Housing Act banned racial discrimination in lending, yet African American and Latino applicants continue to be routinely denied conventional mortgage loans at rates far higher than their white counterparts. In 2011, the North Texas Fair Housing Center did an analysis of Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data and found that African American and Latino mortgage applicants were denied conventional mortgages at much higher rates than whites in the Dallas Fort Worth market. For example, African American mortgage applicants to Wells Fargo Bank were 57% less likely to get a home purchase loan when compared to white applicants. Latino mortgage applicants to Chase Bank were 64% less likely to get a loan than were white applicants. Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data from 2015 and 2016 confirmed the same pattern. One of the most valuable tools we use to investigate housing discrimination is testing. Testing allows us to compare how applicants of color are treated as compared to their white counterparts. As part of our enforcement program, we use the results of testing as evidence in housing discrimination complaints. We file both administrative complaints with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and lawsuits in federal court. The most common form of testing we do is rental testing. In 2011, we conducted rental testing that showed African Americans who were otherwise qualified encountered discrimination in 37% of their housing searches. This means that African Americans face discrimination in two out of every five housing searches. The testing also showed that Latinos experience discrimination in 33% of their housing searches, or at least once in every three housing searches. In our most recent enforcement initiative in 2019, we conducted tests to measure how veterans with housing choice, choice vouchers were treated in the housing market in Dallas, Texas. We conducted a total of 35 tests and the results of 32 of them showed evidence of discrimination. We filed housing discrimination administrative complaints for all 32 tests. The next most common form of testing that we do is sales testing. These tests measure how real estate agents treat buyers of color as compared to their white counterparts. 
In 2018, we conducted sales tests that showed that African American testers are still being steered based on their race to neighborhoods that are predominantly African American and steered away from neighborhoods that are majority white. Unlike rental and sales testing, mortgage lending testing is very resource intensive. One of the challenges is the significant amount of time testers must devote to each test. Unlike rental tests, which can be completed rather quickly, lending interviews involve several complex financial components, even at the pre-application stage. Testers must also be knowledgeable about the entire lending process. Rental, sales, and lending testing can all be used to uncover practices that lead to segregation of neighborhoods. However, there's a particular need to devote resources to lending testing because it is so resource intensive. There is also a need for enforcement of complaints based on lending testing evidence. Because lending testing cases are more complex, they sometimes languish in the administrative process. There is a need for a strong entity with an expertise in lending discrimination that can take the testing evidence generated by local fair housing organizations and move forward with enforcement that, were, that will thwart illegal practices. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this is my, my statement is complete. Thank you very much, Ms. Espinosa. Um, Ms. Cooper, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Chairman Green, Ranking Member Barr, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Cheryl Cooper, and I'm an analyst in financial economics at the Congressional Research Service, focusing on consumer finance markets and policy issues. For those who might be unfamiliar with CRS, our role is to provide objective, nonpartisan research and analysis to Congress. Any arguments presented in my testimony are for the purposes of informing Congress and not to advocate for a particular policy outcome. My testimony today will focus on disparities in access to financial products and services, including racial, ethnic, income, age, and geographic disparities. In particular, I will focus on discussing disparities in access to banking services and disparities in inclusion in the credit reporting system. These areas are generally considered foundational for households to successfully manage their financial affairs and graduate to wealth building activities in the future like home ownership. Consum consumers often rely on family or community connections to get their first bank account, establish a credit history, and gain access to affordable credit. However, research suggests that disparities in family wealth or in community relationships with financial institutions can potentially persist across generations. A factor that may be influencing racial disparities is the intergenerational effects of discrimination, for example, historical mortgage lending uh, practices, red lighting practices. Moreover, violations in fair lending laws can cause harm to consumers who do not get access to financial services. This is important because safe and affordable financial services are an important tool for most American households to help them avoid financial hardship and build assets over the course of their lives. According to the FDIC's 2019 survey, over 5% of households in the United States were unbanked meaning that these households did not have a bank account. In addition, over 17% of households used an unbank, um, a non-bank financial transaction service, like a money order, a check cashing, or a bill payment service. These households are disproportionately racial or ethnic minority and tend to be lower income, younger, and have less formal education. Urban and rural households are more likely to be unbanked compared to suburban households. Unbanked households report that they do not have a bank account because uh, they do not have enough money, they don't trust banks, they have privacy concerns, and they want to avoid high and unpredictable bank fees. These disparities in access are significant because some research suggests the importance of emergency savings and affordable payment transactions. Also, developing a relationship with a bank can sometimes lead to uh, access to other financial products, helping young consumers 
uh, develop a credit history. A limited credit history may serve as a barrier to obtaining affordable credit, yet consumers also can't develop a credit history without access to credit products. This chicken and egg situation can make it difficult for some people to enter the credit reporting system. According to the CFPB, credit scores can't be generated for approximately 20% of the US population due to their limited credit histories. Limited credit history is correlated with age, income, race, and ethnicity. Many of these consumers are young. For example, 40% of credit invis invisibles are under 25 years old. These consumers are disproportionately Black or Latino and live in lower income or rural neighborhoods. Most young adults transition into the credit reporting system in their early 20s. Young adults in lower income and rural neighborhoods tend to make the transition to credit visibility at older ages than young adults in higher income neighborhoods. And notably, in lower income communities, it's less common to enter the credit reporting system through what's called piggybacking or becoming a joint account holder or authorized user on another person's account, such as a parent's account. These disparities in inclusion to the credit reporting system are significant because it's generally a precursor to gain access to affordable credit and eventually to home ownership. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Cooper. Chair will now recognize members for questions. Uh, Mr. Cleaver, the chair of the Subcommittee on Housing, Community Development and Insurance will be recognized at this time for questions. You have five minutes, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity. And I, I, I think this is exactly the, the kind of hearing that, that uh, we need, so thank you. Uh, what I, where I would like to center my, my discussion, my, my questions, is uh, the, the current federal po uh, public policies uh, operate to uh, perpetuate or expand the racial wealth gap um, is something that we have some involvement over. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, the, the, uh, any of the panelists, uh, are there federal uh, public policies that actually uh, contribute uh, to uh, the exclusion of, uh, of African Americans, brown people, people of color, uh, and, uh, and, and what impact does it have on the wealth gap? Federal policies I'm talking about. I'll take a stab at that. You know, one of the things I'm noticing is that current legislation does not address wealth in this country. We measure almost everything by income. And by doing so, you essentially abdicate responsibility of dealing with the structural, the structures that created the gaps in the first place. Um, in many different systems, housing, education, um, and other areas, when if you don't address the wealth gap, you essentially gloss over the, yeah. the, 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 the problem. In addition, um, we also have a, a, a race and space problem. Because racist policies have followed Black people, we see discrimination in rural communities, in urban communities, in suburbs. And for my take, it is hard to not have a race and place approach to change. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, it's not necessarily what the federal government is doing. It's what the federal government is not doing, not measuring, um, not testing, because we have ample data that shows the impact of our policies. But what we, we have not done is um, really get at the reason, the causes for these disparities. Yeah, I, I think you're making a case for the, for the increase of the minimum wage. Uh, and, and I, I, uh, uh, I think that's going to, I mean, that's a, a debate we're having right now, but, um, Congressman, it, Congressman, if I can add on to that too, there are a lot of policies that perpetuate, uh, racial disparity. So, um, in terms of federal policies, the recently promulgated, um, cap rule that was, um, uh, promulgated by the 
the Federal Housing Finance Agency, mm -hmm. the um, the GSE LLPA structure, um, the loan level pricing adjustment structures. It dim discriminates against uh, communities of color. Um, the 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 current affirmatively furthering fair housing rule that was promulgated several months ago uh, by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which um, really eviscerates um, our civil rights um, rules. The current disparate impact rule that was promulgated by the, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, several months ago also eviscerates, eviscerates a major civil rights tool that we have for addressing um, uh, discriminatory policies. So there are many, many federal policies that right now work to um, perpetuate discriminatory outcomes. Thank you. I think my time is running down. Uh, so I, I appreciate uh, both you and uh, uh, Dr. Perry for your comments. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Um, the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Barr, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, last year, I introduced H.R. 8410, the Promoting Access to Capital and Underbanked Communities Act, which is designed to spur de novo bank formation and promote banking services in underserved areas. The bill would ease the upfront burden of opening a bank and provide incentives for banks to open and operate in rural areas. The bill is intended to address the problem of deeply affected counties that I referenced in my opening statement, which have lost a large portion of their bank branches. Uh, Ms. Cooper, how have bank closures in rural communities impacted customers living in those areas? What long-term issues will arise if rural communities continue to face an unprecedented number of bank closures, and we we anticipate that given the trend of bank consolidation, and could a bill like uh, the one I just referenced, designed to promote more banking activity in rural and otherwise underserved areas, help with those problems? Thank you so much for your, uh, for your question, Congressman. Um, um, so as I mentioned in my oral statement, um, there are geographic disparities uh, that exist in terms of access to financial products. And as you mentioned and I mentioned, research suggests that for consumers living in rural areas, these consumers um, may be living further from bank branches or also may be less likely to have access to high-speed internet. And both of these factors could possibly make it more difficult um, for consumers to uh, access quality banking services. Um, we at CRS, uh, don't advocate for a particular policy outcome, um, but I'm happy uh, after this hearing to uh, look at the bill with me and some of my CRS colleagues. I'll say in general um, around trends in terms of consolidation in the banking industry, um, it's been something happening for decades. Uh, we've seen a reduction in community banks for the past few decades, and particularly a reduction in bank in the past decade. And there's a lot of different factors that are leading to this trend. Um, in general, uh, the economists will, would say that uh, you're starting to see economies of scale, which basically means that you know big banks are becoming uh, more profitable than smaller banks to operate. And that's part, probably part of the reason why we're seeing this consolidation in the banking industry. Uh, Ms. Cooper, I did uh, see though, it, and I respect that CRS doesn't uh, make kind of policy endorsements, but I did see in your testimony, possible policy responses section, uh, bank regulation changes. And you mentioned the Community Reinvestment Act. And I think for our uh, friends and neighbors in underserved uh, parts of our country in both urban and rural areas, this is something that that I think would be welcome to give banks more credit for bank account outreach activities in those underserved areas. Do you have any specifics on that? Uh, you know what? You know we we saw an effort by the OCC uh, and Leo Brainerd at the Fed to to um, update CRA, but how can we give uh, incumbent banks and new banks uh, in these underserved areas credit? for um, originating loans, you know, under the CRA? 
Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, you're right. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned in terms of uh, possible possible policy options for um, uh, expanding access to credit were um, possible proposed uh, changes to bank regulation. So this is one of the areas uh, where we see proposals in this case. And so, uh, for example, I know the, the bank regulators have stated that they were considering changes to the Community Reinvestment Act uh, to give banks more credit for uh, bank account outreach activities in underserved communities. Um, but I think there are trade-offs to these types of policies. Um, so the positive, as you were saying, is that it can encourage bank outreach and connect more consumers to banks. Um, but I think the, the flip side to it is also it could give CMA credit for, you know, what some may consider effectively marketing rather than the intention of the law, which was to encourage lending and underserved communities. Well, thank so, you. Yeah, thank I think this that. is an area where there's... And just to reclaim my time in the final time I have, yeah, how is compliance under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act currently tested? And is there any indication that the testing regime needs to be strengthened or, or do regulators currently have enough authority to, to enforce that law? And that's again to you, Ms. Cooper. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, and we're running out of time. So let me get back to you with that. I'm happy to um, answer that question um, with one of my CRS colleagues. Well, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, and, and I know that that is a subject or topic that's part of your legislation, so I invite all, all and any of the witnesses to comment on that um, uh, and, and how we can make sure that ECOA is is uh, is tested. With that, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired, and the witnesses may respond in writing to the gentleman's question. Uh, the chair will now recognize uh, Ms. Adams, uh, the general lady from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our witnesses uh, for your testimony today. Professor Gertie and Mr. Perry, uh, you both have done extensive research and writing on economic and racial inequity in the U.S. Uh, in today's hearing, we focus primarily on how lending discrimination harms individual borrowers of color, uh, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how the same dynamics, primarily racism, also impacts institutions of color, such as historically black colleges and universities. In December of 2019, a study in the Journal of Financial Economics found that HBCUs play higher underwriting fee, pay higher underwriting fees to issue tax exempt bonds compared with similar non-HBCUs, apparently reflecting higher costs of finding uh, willing buyers. The effect of these three times is, is three times larger in the deep south where racial uh, animus remains the most severe. For example, identical differences observed between HBCU and non-HBCUs with uh, AAA ratings or when insured by the same company even before the 2007-2009 financial crisis. HBCUs issued bonds uh, are also more expensive to trade in secondary markets and when they do, uh, sit in dealer inventory longer. So are you familiar with this type of institutional lending discrimination and what policy steps can we take to collect more data on the prevalence of this issue and ultimately to eradicate this type of harmful discrimination in lending for institutions that have been historically underserved and undervalued? It's my impression that uh, this is a serious problem. Uh, but I think it's compounded or generated by the fact that historically black colleges and universities have such low endowment levels that they are then pressured to go into the credit market, a discriminatory credit market to gain resources. And so another way to think about improving their circumstances is something that I think is applicable to, uh, to uh, individual households uh, as well which is we need to build the wealth position of those institutions in such a way that they don't have the same type of pressure to seek predatory lending uh, options to try to maintain their operations. And so we should think about how we could go about building the endowments of historical, historically black colleges and universities so that they are comparable to the endowment levels that exist for uh, white institutions in the United States. Uh, that's where we have a very glaring and dramatic difference. Uh, 
in addition, of course, I think that we do have to confront these kinds of discriminatory practices. And it may be necessary for the federal government to take the bold step of providing public banking services in competition with the private sector to offset the types of behavior that we're observing that the private sector is undertaking. Uh, and one final comment in this context, I said that this parallels the conditions that we observe for households. Uh, because the reason why households are pushed into trying to seek high levels of credit uh, under very, very uh, difficult circumstances, discriminatory circumstances, is again, because their initial levels of wealth are so low. So again, I would say we have to think about asset building in addition to trying to improve credit market conditions. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Perry, did you want to comment? Well, I think Will, um, um, Sandy said everything I was about to say. I mean, in, in a nutshell, I think black institutions are treated like black people. And uh -huh. you have um, school boards, um, universities, are because of their wealth position, have to take essentially subprime um, uh, market uh, products. And so for all the reasons Sandy indicated, but um, so I'll, I'll just leave it there. Okay, thank you, sir. Let me move on quickly. Uh, Ms. 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 Rice, Ms. Espenzio, uh, just how pervasive is lending discrimination in the U.S.? Is it uh, wide scale or is it just a, a small problem? Ms. Rice? Sure. I'm happy to answer that. Um, yeah, it's very wide scale, especially when you um, consider Congresswoman uh, Adams that almost all of the technologies that we use in the lending space, automated underwriting systems, risk-based pricing systems, and credit scoring systems discriminate uh, against consumers of color uh, and under other underserved groups. So. The discrimination is very prevalent, which is why we have to really work to de-bias all of these technologies that we're using in the housing and financial services space. Okay, is the answer time has expired. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The general lady's question can be answered uh, in writing. Uh, Great, thank you. The gentleman, Mr. Loudermilk from Georgia is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, as I was preparing for this hearing, I was trying to think of ways that we as policymakers can help the minority communities have more access to financial services and wealth building. Um, one thing that immediately came to mind, something I've been working on for a long time, is uh, fintech. In recent years, developments in the financial technology arena have made enormous strides toward giving minority consumers access to the banking system. Let's Let me just go through a few of these. First is mobile banking. It makes it easier than ever to open a checking account without having to go into a bank branch. Online lending. It uses fintech platforms and even incorporates artificial intelligence and underwriting and has expanded access to credit to millions of consumers who were credit invisible and didn't qualify for tr a traditional bank loan. Uh, prepaid cards are another. They've enabled consumers who do not have credit or debit card to access to e-commerce. The list goes on and on, and it's not just in consumer finance. A recent study by New York University showed that fintech companies are by far the number one source of PPP loans for Black-owned small business, uh, exceeding minority depository institutions and CDFIs. Fintechs have also been the number one source of PPP lending to Hispanic-owned businesses. As a result of this, I offered an amendment at this committee's markup of the stimulus bill that would allow fintech companies to participate in the state small business credit initiative. Unfortunately, it was rejected by the minority, by the majority. I, I just say if my colleagues are interested in improving access to financial services for minority consumers, I would suggest embracing fintech instead of opposing it. So question, Ms. Cooper, in your testimony, you said that new technology can provide more affordable financial products to consumers. Can you discuss how FinTech has expanded access to credit for minority consumers? Thank you so much for that question, Congressman. So yeah, as you, as you just stated, I think new technology could potentially provide more affordable uh, financial products to underserved communities. 
but it also could introduce consumer protection risks as well. And so this is, you know, similar to what you were saying. Um, one example of this, for example, uh, would be internet-based or um, mobile financial products, which, for example, could lower the cost to provide um, payment services or, or other types of products. But uh, these types of products could have, for example, cybersecurity or privacy risks as well. So I think there's always a trade-off there when you're thinking about this stuff. Well, thank you uh, for that, and I appreciate it. Um, on another note, because of these developments and what you've laid out, uh, data security and data privacy laws, I think, need to be updated, and we need a uniform national standard. Do you have any thoughts on that as well? Uh, no. In general, I'd say that uh, CRS does not advocate for any particular policy outcome, um, and, and I personally am not the one at CRS who covers those issues, but I'm happy to put you in touch with the CRS analyst that does to work with you and your, your um, staffers. Well, I appreciate that. And as we continue to hopefully uh, promote FinTech, since it is um, very beneficial in uh, underserved areas of our nation and in underserved uh, demographics, um, that we do have to address some limitations, which could be the data security, because we're looking at more than 50 different standards we have to deal with. So I appreciate uh, the time here, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentle lady from Michigan, Ms. Talib, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all so much for being with us. Um, as we all know, despite decades of civil rights laws on the books, black home ownership is plunging across the nation with the worst losses right here happening in Michigan. Detroit has seen a dramatic shift from a city of homeowners where black family members and, and, and could build intergenerational wealth to now a city of renters. And the predatory lenders on Wall Street who crashed the economy in 2007, 2008, as we know, got bailed out while many of my residents got foreclosed on by the thousands. Redlining never ended in Detroit. In 2019, in a city of more than 650,000 people, there were only 1,535 mortgages issued. And that's up from 2012, when we only had 244 mortgages that were reported. When mortgages are issued in Detroit, they go towards those that are white borrowers who are a small minority of the population. And so the unwillingness of banks to lend in Detroit and other majority black communities pushes our residents into riskier arrangements like land contracts, which offer opportunities, but also fewer protections and have been abused by predatory sellers. So Ms. Rice, we know banks aren't drawing red lines on a map anymore, but that discrimination still persists. Can you describe some of the tactics and technology that lenders use now to perpetuate racial redlining? Sure, thank you so much for that question. Um, and it's a critically important issue. I'm from Toledo, Ohio. And so I'm very familiar with the Detroit market and other markets like it. So one major problem that we have in cities like Detroit is that a lot of the housing stock is very affordable um, and is priced under $100,000. And for a variety of reasons, it is extremely difficult in today's marketplace for consumers to access mortgage credit in the financial mainstream when you're trying to get a what we call a smaller dollar loan. Um, so the, the qualified mortgage rule coupled with the uh, LLPAs from the GSEs coupled with other uh, federal policies really restrict credit access for more affordable loans. So that's a major problem. The other problem is the industry's over-reliance on credit scores. Back when I used to be on, um, underwriting mortgages years ago, one of the key, two of the key things that I relied on to determine a borrower's credit worthiness were what are your current housing payments? Like, have you been paying your rent on time? And if you've been paying your current housing uh, bill on time, you're a very good uh, candidate and also, what is your housing payment uh, shock? So is the new mortgage that you're going to be paying appreciably different from your um, the housing payment that you've been used to making? And if you've been paying your, your rent on time, and if there's really no housing payment shock, 
you are a very good candidate for getting uh, credit. But we don't use those two indicators anymore. Mm -hmm. Today, we over rely on credits, uh, on, on algorithmic based systems like credit scores, automated underwriting systems that don't include those kinds of indicators. And you heard um, one of the other panelists are already testify that consumers of color are disproportionately credit invisible. Mm -hmm. So just the systems that we have in place in order to get people, uh, get, give people entree into the financial mainstream are blocking folks out because those systems do not work yeah, yeah. for underserved communities. Sorry, yeah, thank you, Ms. Rice. I'm not sure what, how much time I have, but I just want folks on the panel and just the public to notice that none of this discrimination we're talking about today is explicitly spelled out in some sort of company handbook, that it's all implicit and cloaked in like proxies and code words and misguided assumptions. And in effect, regardless of the intent uh, is to disproportionately deny home ownership opportunities to black and brown folks. So we have the tools to fight it. And, you know, just last year, though, unfortunately, Trump's HUD uh, stri striked a huge blow to fair housing protection with its disparate impact final rule, which failed to comply with the Supreme Court's inclusive uh, our communities decision. And we need to address that, Chairman. We also know that um, as recently in 2015, a Supreme Court recognized the continued availability of disparate impact litigation under Fair Housing Act. We need to restore these protections. They're getting watered down by conservative courts and decisions. And so I just hope that our committee can proceed and be very intentional about addressing those, uh, for me, uh, discrimination that leaves a lot of my residents out of opportunities for economic stability. And thank you, and I yield. The general lady's time has expired. Uh, we will now hear from uh, Mr. Mooney from West Virginia for five minutes. And thereafter, we will take our break. So if you are after Mr. Mooney, you might move over to cast your vote now and we'll cast our second vote as well. We'll cast two votes before we return. Uh, so please now, Mr. Mooney, uh, are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my concerns are gonna address, you know, access to rural banking, generally speaking. I'm, and I'm gonna direct the question to Shell Cooper, uh, but I wanna talk about, highlight how rural West Virginians and anyone in rural areas, uh, some of the concerns related to getting uh, my constituents and others access to loans, credit, and banking, any and all banking services in general. According to a survey by the FDIC, 7.8% uh, of West Virginia households are unbanked. This puts West Virginia in the bottom 10 in the nation in terms of unbanked households. So the question, uh, Ms. Cooper, what can we do to help rural, rural Americans get access to credit and basic financial services. And, and just as a quick follow-up to that, after you answer that one, uh, how do you feel of the, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected efforts to reach the unbanked? Thank you so much for your uh, questions, Congressman. So yeah, in general, um, I know we've already spoken about this in, in my uh, oral and written statements. I've, I've mentioned some of the geographic disparities, um, the fact that research suggests consumers living in rural areas um, maybe living further from big branches, less likely to have uh, access to high-speed internet, and for these reasons might um, make it more difficult for them to access uh, quality banking services. Um, in general, in my written um, testimony, uh, I talk about some policy options uh, that are often discussed in this space, um, just generally to increase uh, access to credit to consumers. And so there are five broad uh, types of uh, policy approaches in this space. Uh, first, I'll say uh, changes, possible changes to bank regulation to further encourage banks to serve underserved communities. Second, um, payment system improvements that may make bank products more attractive. Uh, third, are financial technologies to potentially increase access um, to consumers. The fourth is the government directly providing certain financial products uh, directly to consumers. And the fifth is financial education programs. And so I'd say in terms of all of these policy options, uh, they all have uh, costs and benefits and um, potential unintended impacts and risks. Um, so, but, but they're all things uh, that could be uh, potential places to explore in this space if you're interested in um, expanding access to credit. Um, 
Thank you so much. And then your second question was around um, the COVID-19 pandemic, is that correct? That's correct, how, that, how you feel that affected efforts to reach the unbanked. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I'm actually not aware of that much data uh, since, since the COVID-19 pandemic is um, something that's you know happened in this past year. Um, and the, the FDIC survey that they do regularly uh, was most recently done in 2019. Um, but yeah, I think um, at least at the beginning of the pandemic, there were a lot of reports of um, more people uh, accessing banking services online, um, given the pandemic, uh, that pattern makes sense. Um, so I do think that's an interesting trend in this space around banking services since, since the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. At this time, we will stand in recess for the members to cast two votes.
five minutes to you for your questions. We will um, stand in recess for a bit longer. Uh, we are awaiting the arrival of our ranking member and additional members. So please be a little bit patient with us as I've indicated.
Uh, we will continue with the questions. And next in order for questions will be Mr. Garcia of Illinois. Uh, Mr. Garcia, you're recognized for five minutes to ask your question. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for convening this important meeting. Uh, when we talk about wealth in this country uh, and opportunities to build wealth, we have to talk about housing. So when I think about the wealth gap, I think about neighborhoods like mine. I represent a working class, mostly Latino community in Chicago. I've lived here for more than 50 years. Most of my constituents are renters and the housing crisis they're facing now under COVID-19 isn't new. My neighbors are squeezed. On the one hand, our communities can't get the investment they need. On the other hand, working class, Latino, black uh, people are being pushed out of their own neighborhoods by wealthier white residents who do have access to capital. So I'm glad to talk with you today to learn more about what's driving that and what we can do to support working class communities and communities of color, especially. I thank all the witnesses for being here. I'd like to ask Ms. Uh, Espinosa, uh, a question on bank mergers. This country had 12,000 banks in 1990, and now it has fewer than 5,000. The Fed and the Department of Justice rubber stamp bank merger applications without a second thought. Uh, even though mergers can often close down local bank branches and leave communities underserved. Do you find that consolidation in the banking industry has a negative impact on marginalized communities? And does it hurt access to credit in communities like mine? It does, <clears throat> excuse me, it does hurt access to credit. And one of the things that we've seen here with the bank mergers is, is that the, um, the Community Reinvestment Act requirements they don't change when banks merge. So instead of them having to do twice the amount, for example, um, by merging, they're actually having to do less under the CRA. Um, so it's definitely hurting people and it hurts people of color because as they merge, they seem to close down branches in minority neighborhoods that are predominantly African-American and Latino. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question of uh, uh, Mr. Andre Perry uh, on the appraisal gap. Uh, Mr. Perry, in your uh, testimony, you mentioned recent high profile instances of the appraisal gap. Uh, that is when a family's home is appraised at a low value because of racial discrimination. This is a huge problem in my city of Chicago. Could you talk a little bit more about how the appraisal gap hurts communities that have always had a hard time getting loans and what can Congress and housing advocates do to get help? Yeah, that's a difficult one because Congress does not authorize appraisals. Um, however, there are some key areas that we know are at fault. Um, we know that the price comparison model in which um, homes are compared to um, other homes in similar neighborhoods essentially recycles racism because if you are essentially measuring homes against those um, to other homes that have been impacted by discrimination, you really never get to sense of values. The other area that is, is, is clear that home improvements are not treated the same in, in um, black and brown communities as they are in, in white communities. And we see that time and time again. And there's one other area, and this is the area um, Dodd-Frank created a arm's length relationship between appraisers and lenders. And it seems that in some communities, it is very strict where lenders and appraisers don't talk at all. And it results in um, loans falling through, where in white communities, there seems to be enough communication to come to a uh, an agreed upon price. And so um, those are those the three areas I see uh, some of the biggest problems. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't have any more questions at this time. I've got to get to my vote. The gentleman yields back. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, the vice ranking member, Mr. Timmons, 
from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Cooper, since the 1990s, the median wealth among minority families has plateaued while it has increased roughly 50% for white families. This is a huge problem as white families on average now have 41 times the wealth of black families and 22 times the wealth of Latino families. I think that we can all agree that that is a major problem. A friend of mine that, that, that is black, he explained it to me in a way that really stuck with me. He said, imagine a game of Monopoly. Certain families have been playing for generations. They've been pass and go, collecting $200. They've been purchasing property, building houses, building hotels, buying the railroads. And certain families have started much later. And it, it's challenging to play the game. It's challenging to compete. It's challenging to have a chance when you're faced with those kind of odds. So a, a racial wealth gap has always been an issue. But why would you say it has gotten worse over the last few decades? And does it have anything to do with lending practices of financial institutions? Well, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so as I was saying in my oral testimony, um, so research, as, as you were describing, research suggests that disparities in uh, family wealth or in community relationships with financial institutions can potentially persist across generations. So for example, from parents to children, um, influencing children's financial outcomes. So for example, um, children's credit history or um, uh, home ownership status. And so in this way, uh, past discrimination can cause intergenerational effects. Um, and, and as I described, uh, these disparities exist in terms of access to um, financial products. Um, I'll say in general, um, uh, I'm not aware of research uh, around, you know, increases or decreases in, in some of these disparities um, over time. A lot of this uh, research, particularly around intergenerational effects, is, um, you know, relatively new in the past decade or so. Um, but I'm happy to get back to you and, and do some more research on that question. Well, I'd like to sure, comment, thank you. if I may, uh, which is, uh, is to say that uh, the widening gap that we've observed is in part attributable to the adverse effects of the Great Recession, but more significantly is due to the cumulative nature of wealth accumulation and decumulation across generations. Uh, that is to say, wealth begets wealth and lack of wealth begets lack of wealth. And so communities that have been subjected to denial and deprivation have less of an opportunity to transfer resources across generations. And therefore, we observe a, a widening gap over the, uh, over the course of time. It's a secular effect that's associated with the very way in which people acquire additional assets. And, sure, uh, uh, Mr. I, Mr. Darity, let me follow up on that. I appreciate you jumping in. Um, yeah. Would you agree that it's it's a worthy endeavor to try to find ways to give people opportunities that have not had op opportunities in the past without necessarily putting people um, that do not fall into that category at a disadvantage? Um, so it, I'm in the military. I'm in the South Carolina Air National Guard, and we, we talk a lot about these issues. And the question becomes, um, not everyone is in the same uh same same box and if you're going to try to give people opportunity that have not had opportunities in the past that is a worthy endeavor and and i actually support that my my, my concern is that there are people that would be lumped in with the the people that theoretically have had opportunities that really haven't had opportunities so while we look at these statistics and i agree they're actually quite terrible and we need to take steps. Mm -hmm. The question is, if, if someone is not necessarily in the in the bucket of wealth begets wealth, they, they're struggling just like anyone else. How do we not disadvantage that person? Um, d does that question make sense to you, sir? Uh, it makes sense to me, but uh, I think that we have to recognize that those differences in opportunity historically have been racialized to the point that Whites who are in the bottom 20% of the income distribution have a higher median level of wealth than all black Americans taken together. 
And so I would argue that there is a racial differential that needs to be addressed. And uh, I will do everything I can oh. to help address that because I do agree. I do agree with you um, in, in large part. And I guess my next question is, uh, would you segment out? Expired. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Uh, because we're trying to get in before this next vote, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, and we will move on now to uh, Ms. Garcia of Texas. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for hosting uh, this hearing, and thank you to all the witnesses, and most of all, thank you for your patience as we struggle to do these votes. I want to start with Ms. Rice. Ms. Rice, um, a, a, uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting re project revealed that out of 31 million home mortgage disclosure act records, that modern day redlining still exists in 61, 61 metro areas in our country. As compared to white borrowers, lenders denied African American borrowers at significantly higher rates in 48 cities, Latinos in 25 cities, Asian Americans in nine cities, and Native Americans in three cities. Still, fully 98% of the banks nationally received a passing grade in the Community Reinvestment Act examination. What is wrong here? Do you think that we need to redo how we grade for the Community Reinvestment Act? And what would moving from a pass fail system to a more transparent letter grade be better? Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Garcia, for that question. One of the challenges that we face uh, with the Community Reinvestment Act and the CRA examinations is that uh, it is not automatically a given that if there are fair lending violations at a financial institution, that that will translate into um, a lower score for the financial uh, institution. And so uh, oftentimes fair lending violations are not even considered um, uh, in terms of, of being reflected in the ultimate score for the financial institution. And that is why you've seen since 1977, multiple instant when the fair when the Community Reinvestment Act was enacted, you've seen multiple example over and over again of financial institutions who have been found to violate the Fair Housing Act. So they are engaged, they have been found to have engaged in discrimination, receiving an outstanding CRA grade. Part of that is because CRA is tied to income. So the Community Reinvestment Act says that uh, lenders are supposed to be meeting the uh, credit needs of their entire delineated community, including low income areas. And for some reason, you know, it just depends on, on um, the guidance at the regulatory agencies at the particular time, but um, for some reason, that, that part that says that the banks are supposed to meet the, the credit needs of their entire community, somehow communities of color don't get picked up in that definition. Should we look at other uh, punishment, if you will? Should we look at, at, at criminal uh, uh, sanctions for intentional discrimination by, by the, um, the landlords, the builders, the mortgage companies? We can certainly look at that, uh, uh, whether or not there should be criminal violations. But I think um, one of the first steps that should be taken is we should add race as a consideration explicitly in the Community Reinvestment Act. So it makes it clear that lenders cannot redline uh, communities of color. They cannot avoid serving communities of color in order to get um, the the higher grades in the CRA designations. And also, um, I, lenders should be required to include communities of color in their service area. In other words, you shouldn't be able to carve out uh, neighborhoods of color in when you're designating what is your service area. Right, but it's as my colleague, Ms. Talib mentioned, I mean, nobody goes around and says, Okay, neighborhood A, you're being redlined. It's a lot more subtle 
Uh, and with algorithms and the tech that's being used now, it's you know it's hard to find and it's hard to to uh, uh, find the right appropriate enforcement tool. Um, but but thank you for that. And I wanted to ask quickly, Mrs. Espinosa, because I know I'm running out of time. Uh, you mentioned the three different kinds of testing that that, that you all do and, and look at. I think you said there was rental testing, uh, sales testing, and mortgage testing. How complicated is that and about how much money do you all need for more testing so that we can prove up some of these cases easier? Um, if well, I may, uh, Ms. Espinoza, the, the general lady's time has expired and we're trying to get back for the next vote. Oh, okay, so I can address that in writing. Your answer in writing, please, Ms. Espinoza. Oh, thank you, Ms. Espinoza. I yield back, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. All right, that's quite all right. We're trying to get to everybody. Um, we will now go to uh, Ms. Williams of Georgia for five minutes. And my apologies to everyone, but we do want to finish before the next vote. Thank you, Hi. Chairman Green, um, and thank you for convening this hearing today. In my district and across the country, we see racial wealth disparities brought on by, by barriers like invidious discrimination. In 2019, the median wealth in black households was about 24,000 compared to 188,000 for white households, with the gap sure to continue to widen because of, of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19. I have an obligation in Congress to work to break down these barriers and ensure communities of color have a fair chance to buy homes, start their own businesses, and even send their kids to college without taking on the massive debt that I've had to incur. When fewer of us face barriers to building wealth and long-term prosperity, the better off our economy, our communities, and our people will be. Professor Darity, student debt certainly stands in the way of closing the racial wealth gap. But in your testimony, you mentioned that there are some limitations to focusing exclusively on debt reduction. What are some next steps that we should consider from an asset building perspective to lessen the financial burden of things like going to college for communities of color? Uh, historically, uh, the United States has practiced asset building policies. Representative of these are the 19th century policies that involved land allocation. Uh, in the 20th century, the policies were focused primarily on, on supporting home ownership. Uh, I would argue, though, that since uh, the 1960s, the entire emphasis of federal policy has been on income supports rather than wealth building or asset building. And so if we are really concerned about improving opportunities for all Americans, to engage in the widest range of opportunities, there needs to be a shift back towards asset building opportunities. And uh, I would think that if we are thinking about individuals having an opportunity to go to college and to leave college on a debt-free basis, either we have to eliminate the expense of attending college altogether. Uh, some people have advocated uh, zero tuition for attending state universities. I think that's a, an idea that should be explored. But on the other hand, I think that uh, we tend to think about education as driving wealth, but we really should think about wealth as driving educational achievement. And so if we could alter the foundation for assets that are held by a large number of wealth poor families in the United States, we would create greater opportunities for their kids to go further in school and not have to do so on the basis of the acquisition of uh, extraordinary levels of indebtedness. And, and Representative um, um, Williams, I just wanted to add that there are a number of innovative products going on right now, which are enabling people to get a mortgage and cancel debt at the same, a student loan debt at the same time. And, and I think those are the kind of products we need to see in communities. Thank you so much. Um, and Professor Darity, I appreciate that. Ms. Rice, I do have a quick question for you. As we've heard today, we must break down the discriminatory, discriminatory barriers to things like owning a home if we really wanna close the racial wealth gap. In your testimony, you offered some suggestions to increase diversity in real estate industry. Do you have any additional recommendations for increasing diversity in other parts of the financial services industry that impact how communities of color access housing? Yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the first things we have to do is break down uh, barriers to credit access. 
uh, and the over-reliance on things like credit score. Um, credit scores are a major factor that preclude uh, people of color from being able to access uh, financial services. People of color disproportionately live in credit deserts. Um, they also disproportionately live in communities where there is a hyper concentration of non-traditional financial services providers who do not report positive behavior to the credit repositories. So that's a huge thing that we need to break down and we can actually use new artificially intelligent tools in order to do that. But we do need more support from regulators and, and um, Congress in order to onboard those new de-biasing, tech, tech de-biasing uh, methodologies so that we can expand opportunities for people. And I'll just think, oh, and okay. we're out of time um, because the, we only get five minutes, but I appreciate everyone being here today. And I look forward to working, to working with everyone in the subcommittee as we continue to address these disparities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. And thank you very much for being a, a little bit conscious of the time. I greatly appreciate it. Let me move expeditiously and yield myself five minutes so that we may quickly get to the next vote. Uh, I was here in 2008 when we had the downturn in the economy. And uh, one of the questions that we asked uh, quite consistently was, would anyone go to jail for the predatory lending that took place? The answer to the question is yes, someone did, one person. One person went to jail for that long line of um, predatory lending that took place. In fact, we had one CEO of a major bank who settled out of court with the Justice Department and the bank's board of directors gave this CEO a 74% 74, 74 raise in salary, amounting to about $20 million. So the question becomes this, do we want to continue to allow persons who make loan applications to be punished criminally for falsifying information on a loan application while the loan originator does not face any charges if the loan originator denies a person credit. Now, that's predatory lending, by the way. If you intentionally deny a person credit that is qualified for this credit, you are engaging in predatory lending, which is a crime. Uh, but the question becomes, uh, how do we deal with it? And testing is the means by which we can acquire the empirical evidence necessary to prosecute these crimes. So let me start with um, you, uh, Ms. Rice. Uh, would you give me some indication as to how efficacious testing is, uh, your opinion, with reference to bringing forth the empirical evidence necessary to prosecute? Testing is extremely uh, efficacious for that pur purpose. And thank you so much, Congressman Green, for that question. The Supreme Court actually has stated that testing is um, one of the most um, um, veritable and efficient ways of ferreting out discrimination. Um, part of the challenge is, though, that we don't have sufficient funding to support testing um, in the United States. And it, it is private fair housing organizations who engage in testing on a consistent fashion, as you've heard um, Francis Espinosa uh, already testify to. But the challenge is that, you know, some years we have very, very little funding to support testing. And in some years we have more funding, but we never have sufficient funding. The yeah, other thing let me, that- Let me intercede for just a quick section, a second. I'm familiar with FIP and FAP. Uh, here is something that's important. In HR 166, we provide for, in the Financial Protection Bureau, a, an entity within that entity to conduct these tests. Uh, we want to formalize it to a greater degree. I still support FIP and FAP, the Fair Housing Initiative. Uh, that's a great program, uh, so I, I'm going to support it. But uh, I, what I'd like to know is, if we put this together, with the CFPB, does that give you some greater degree of belief that we can police and deter those who would intentionally deny people loans? That's right. Yes, I do. I, I and we we vehemently support 
um, the the bill that um, that you referenced, fair housing um, for fair lending for all bill. It, it definitely will, and it's important for Congress to include protectors, guardrails so that the testing program can be ongoing uh, no matter who is in control or who is, is at the helm of the organization. Let me move quickly to Ms. Espinosa. Ms. Espinosa, would you agree that uh, testing is uh, an efficacious methodology and would you support uh, HR 166 as we propose having testing take place? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I, I testing is the, um, it's the best way to uncover discriminatory practices in All right. And uh, so let me ask uh, Mr. Perry, would you agree as well? Yes, in, in, um, in fact, journalists and individuals are going to do this to you. I'm going to have to accept your yes. Yes. I'm running out of time and I can't be unfair to others by giving myself more time. Uh, just let me say to uh, the professor, professor, I'm very much familiar with Andrew Johnson and uh, what happened. Um, especially as it relates to him in 1868, when there was an effort to impeach him, uh, I would add that he was the bigot of his time and he uh, denied the newly freed persons the opportunity to start to amass wealth with the land that would have been accorded them. I can only say this, uh, I don't pretend to say that this is the silver bullet, but this will at least help us with some of the credit issues. I do agree with you that the wealth issue is something of paramount importance. With this said, I, my time has expired, friends. I do appreciate all of the witnesses for being here today. Uh, your, your being here and being patient with us has meant a lot to us. I regret that we had to intercede with votes, but these things happen. And we now have another vote that we have to deal with. So thank you, all of you. The meeting is now adjourned after I read a statement, excuse me. There are some a statement that I have to read before we can adjourn this meeting. So please be patient as I move to the statement. Um, okay, <clears throat> I thank the witnesses for their testimony and for devoting the time and resources to share the expertise with this subcommittee. Your testimony today will help to advance the important work of this subcommittee and of Congress in addressing lending discrimination and systemic racial inequality. The chair notes that some members may have additional questions for this panel which they may wish to submit in writing. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for five legislative days for members to submit written questions to these questions to these witnesses and to place their responses in the record. Also without objection, members will have five legislative days to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members to submit written questions and materials for the record to the email address provided to your staff. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you so much.